Hi there, and welcome to this guide on how to play GKR Heavy Hitters. We're going to play through a full round. The board is currently set up as if we're several rounds into the game, so that we can get into some of the different actions you'll see throughout the game. Diamondback will be our Glory Hound. The Glory Hound is usually determined by a dice roll during setup, and then it moves around throughout the game. The Glory Hound is always the first player to play during any given phase. Everyone begins each round with six faction cards in their hand. These cards are drawn from your draw deck and placed into your hand. They represent your heavy hitter's health and your ability to attack, defend, and perform special moves. Yellow is the Glory Hound, so yellow goes first. They play a deploy card, which allows them to deploy a support unit. They're going to play a recon unit, and they can put it anywhere within two spaces from their heavy hitter. Deploying a support unit also costs two energy. Players begin each round with five free energy. Throughout the round, you'll do a lot of different things. Deploy, move, attack, and all of them cost energy. Play continues in clockwise order. Blue chooses not to deploy. Next is Green, who plays a free deploy sponsor card. This sponsor card is then placed on the sponsor discard pile. So Green deploys their combat unit one space from their heavy hitter. This costs no energy. Orange doesn't deploy either. So now that everyone's had a chance to deploy, that's the end of the deploy phase. Next is the movement phase. Yellow is the glory hound. Yellow doesn't move their heavy hitter. Play proceeds clockwise, with each person playing their heavy hitter, then everyone plays their combat support unit, then each repair unit, followed by each recon, in that order. Not everyone will choose to move, and not everyone will have deployed each support unit, so in those cases, just proceed to the next person. Blue moves their heavy hitter three spaces. Players can move their heavy hitters as many spaces as they like, but they have to spend one energy for each hex moved. You can move your heavy hitter through a space occupied by your own faction, but not through other factions. Next, green moves their heavy hitter two hexes past their combat unit, costing them two energy. They also rotate their facing. Whenever you move your heavy hitter, you can decide which way it faces when you complete your movement. You can also choose to stay in the same place and only change facing, which doesn't cost any energy. We'll get to why facing is important in a bit. Next is Orange, who moves three spaces, spending three energy. Now we move each combat unit. Yellow moves their combat unit one space. Blue doesn't have a combat unit deployed and Green decides not to move their combat unit. Orange moves their combat unit one space. Moving support units doesn't cost energy, but each support unit has a card showing how many spaces it can move. So this combat unit can move up to one space or use its special ability, moving up to two spaces at the cost of one energy. Next, each player moves their repair unit. Yellow doesn't have a repair unit deployed. Next is Blue, who moves their repair unit one space. There are no other repair units. Lastly, each player moves their recon units. Yellow keeps their recon where it is. Blue doesn't have one and neither does green. Orange moves their recon unit two spaces. That's the end of the movement phase. Next, it's the combat phase. The first thing to know is that weapons and support units have a firing range, which is measured in the number of hexes one robot is from another. A weapon has to fire directly. It can't swerve around or through buildings. So what happens when the shortest distance between two robots has a building in the way? Like say, yellow's heavy hitter wants to fire at blue. Well, the buildings provide cover, so if the shortest path to the robot you're trying to target goes through a building, too bad, you can't hit that robot. In some instances, there may be two paths that are both the shortest, and only one of them is blocked by a building. In that case, the robot adjacent to the building has partial cover, so if Blue wants to attack Green, they can. Green is totally exposed because the shortest distance doesn't have a building in the way. But if green attacks blue, blue has partial cover. You can still hit a robot with partial cover, but it's more difficult. There is only one way to attack a robot with full cover. So going back to yellow here, this heavy hitter currently can't see blue's heavy hitter, but yellow's recon unit can. So if you look at the card for yellow's recon unit, you can see each support unit has a line of sight. This recon's line of sight is five, and blue's heavy hitter is one, two, three, four spaces away. That means the recon unit can see Blue's heavy hitter. If Yellow has a missile weapon, they can fire it at Blue's heavy hitter and use their recon unit to spot. 
Each player has a pilot, and pilots have unique abilities. So Kemi's ability here, she can discard cards and draw new ones to get better cards in her hand. Now let's choose weapons. Each player will choose the weapons they're going to fire and bring in their support units. First, place the cards for each support unit on the battlefield in a row. Yellows playing their combat unit and recon unit, and looking at the weapons in their hand, they're also going to play a Viper missile. Place chosen weapons face down next to the support unit cards. Each player chooses their weapons before anyone attacks. So blue has their repair unit, and they're choosing their Thunderstrike missiles. Green has their combat unit on the board, and they're firing a hammer throw and an orbital strike. Orange has their combat and recon units, and they're firing a lone wolf missile. Once everyone's chosen all their weapons, they reveal and place them in numerical order from highest to lowest firing speeds. The weapon with the highest firing speed across all players goes first. They then go in numerical order with the next highest weapon across all players firing, and next, and next. Now that all weapons are revealed, everyone spends the energy cost of their weapons. Support units don't cost energy, but weapons fired by the heavy hitters do. Yellow's Viper missile here costs one energy to fire. Blue's weapon costs three energy, which brings them to negative one on the energy track. When you overspend your energy during a round, either in the combat phase or in the movement phase, you take damage. Damage means you take a card either from your hand or from the draw deck and put it in the damage pile. If you choose to damage a card from the top of the draw pile, you can't look at the card until after you've decided to put it in damage. Once you've chosen the card, you can look to see what you're losing, but you can't change your mind. So Blue has to take a card. They decide to destroy their paint gun from their hand and place it face down in the damage pile. Next is Green, who plays a sponsor card. It's a sponsored strike which says, pay no energy for one declared weapons round. Green had two weapons, which cost one energy to fire, so they use this sponsor card and don't pay the one energy. The sponsor card they used gets discarded. Orange has a lone wolf missile, which costs one energy. Now we fight. The first weapon to fire is 874, which is Orange's recon unit. The weapon range is one to three, but no one is in range, so there's no one they can hit, so that weapon comes off the board. Next is Green's weapon, the hammer throw, which has a weapon range of one to three and does two damage. Green is going to do an alley shot at Orange. Usually, Green and Orange would have full coverage from each other because the shortest paths go through buildings. However, if a player sits behind two adjacent buildings, they can take what's known as an alley shot or crack shot and hit Orange, but they'd still have full cover from Orange. If Orange was also next to the two buildings on the other side, they'd both be able to alley shot. In this case, Orange can't, but Green can. Usually, to hit a heavy hitter, you need to roll two attack dice with a total value of five or higher. When it's through an alley shot, it's a harder shot to take, so it's plus two to the required roll. That means Green needs to roll a seven to hit Orange's heavy hitter. Green rolls and gets an eight, so Orange is hit. The weapon Green used does two damage, so Orange gets to do an armor save. With the armor save, Orange rolls one defense die per damage, and each die needs to hit a certain number to defend that damage point. Because it was Orange's heavy hitter that was hit, they have to roll a five or higher, so a five or six on each die is a success. Orange rolls to defend. They roll a one and a five. The five means they save against that one of damage, but the one got through, so Orange takes one damage. Damage during combat, just like damage from overspending energy, means putting a card on the damage pile. Green's successful alley shot also means Green gets an achievement. There's an achievements board, which has four different things that pilots can attempt throughout the game, such as successful crack shots, destroying buildings, and successful flank shots. Each time a player does something that's listed as an achievement, they move up the ratings board, which unlocks upgrades to their dice rolls. This alley shot earns an achievement, so Green moves one space up the ratings board, unlocking their first upgrade which now gives them plus one to all attack rolls against opposing support units. Whenever you play a weapon, it goes into the discard pile on your dashboard, so that weapon has been fired and now it's discarded. Next weapon to fire is Green's combat unit with a firing speed of 650, and they're going to target Orange's combat unit. Usually, attacking a support unit needs a combined roll of seven or higher, but because Orange has partial cover due to one of the shortest paths passing through a building, they'll need to roll plus one, so an eight. However, 
Green unlocked that upgrade, which adds plus one to each of their attack rolls against opposing support units, so rolling a seven would give them the roll needed for a successful hit. Green rolls, but rolls a six, so they missed. Next weapon is 537, which is Yellow's combat support unit. They have a range of three to four and deal two damage, so they can attack Orange's heavy hitter or recon unit, both of which have partial cover. Yellow is going to aim for the recon unit to try and prevent Orange from tagging the building, so Yellow needs an eight to hit. Usually, support units require a roll of seven for a successful attack, but because the recon unit has partial cover, that's a plus one, making it eight. Yellow rolls double sixes, which is a critical hit. That means automatic damage with no chance for an armor save. So Orange doesn't roll any defense dice and takes two damage. All recon units only have one hit point, so the two damage destroys that recon unit. Anytime a support unit is destroyed, it gets taken off the board and placed back into player supply. However, players can bring them back with a deploy card during the next deploy phase. So support units are constantly destroyed and brought back onto the board throughout the game. Next weapon is 346, Blue's Repair Unit. Repair units have a range of one. However, they have a special ability where, rather than attack a unit, they can choose to try and repair their heavy hitter. The catch is they have to be in a hex adjacent to the heavy hitter to do it. So they roll one die. On a roll of one to two, nothing happens. A roll of three to five means they can take a card of their choice from the damage deck and put it into their discard pile. And a roll of six means they can take a card of their choice from the damage deck and put it straight into their hand. So we have Blue's Repair Unit here. They roll a five, which means they can look through their damage pile, choose a card, and then put it back into their discard pile. Next card is 337, which is Yellow Viper's Missile. It has a range of three to four and does three damage. Blue's Heavy Hitter is one, two, three, four spaces away, so they're within range, but they have full cover, so Yellow can't attack because they can't see them. But because this is a missile weapon which is indirect, Yellow can use their recon unit to spot, like we showed you earlier. Whenever you use an indirect attack when you're spotting, a building no longer offers any cover to the defender. Another important thing to keep in mind is the special power written on the weapon card. With a Viper Missile, that player can spend one more energy to make an automatic hit. So Yellow spends one extra energy, and they don't need to roll attack dice. It's a straight hit. The damage is three, so Blue rolls three dice to do an armor save. They roll a two, a four, and a five, which means they can save on the five but take two damage. So again, the cards can come from their hand or their draw pile and go to their damage deck. Next weapon is a 324, which has a weapon range of three to six and deals two damage. Also, this card has special power. It has a plus one to its attack roll. To hit a heavy hitter, you usually need a roll of five, but this weapon only needs a four, so that weapon is going to target Blue's heavy hitter. It's got partial cover, since one of the shortest paths goes through an adjacent building. Usually, you need to roll a five to hit a heavy hitter, and the partial cover makes it a six, but since the special power of this weapon gives a plus one to the attack roll, they still only need a five to hit. They roll a three, so that's a miss. Next is weapon 237, Yellow's Recon Unit, which has a range of one to two. There's nothing within that range, so that unit can't fire. Next is 124, which is Orange's Combat Unit, basically returning fire to Green's Combat Unit. Green over here has partial cover, so while normally a support unit needs a roll of seven to hit, the partial cover means the roll must be an eight to hit. However, as you can see on the ratings boards, Orange has an attack roll upgrade, so they only need to roll a seven to hit. So plus one for the partial cover, but then minus one again for the attack roll upgrade. So they need a seven to hit, but roll a double one. Rolling double one is called a critical miss. If your heavy hitter is attacking and you roll a double one, then the weapon you are trying to fire with goes straight to the damage pile. If a support unit is attacking and rolls a critical miss, they'll take a one hit to their health. In this case, Orange's combat unit has had a critical miss, so this takes their hit points from three down to two. The next weapon is an orbital strike from green. An orbital strike has no range. It just unleashes an energy beam anywhere on the board on any target they choose and does four damage without the need for an attack roll. 
However, the player who was attacked still has the chance to do an armor save. Once an orbital strike is fired, the card goes straight into the damage pile. It can be repaired, but it's hard to get back. So green is going to target orange's heavy hitter, dropping four damage straight onto them, and that card goes onto the damage pile. Orange does an armor save, but only rolls enough to save one of the damage, so they take three of their cards from their hand or their draw pile and place them into their damage pile. The final weapon is Blue's missile, which has a range of three to six. If you look at the ability, it does six damage, but does one more damage if it's in the five or six range. That means the further away it is within range, the more damage it does. So Blue attacks Green's heavy hitter, which is four within range, so it will do six damage. This will also be a flank attack. Each heavy hitter has three front faces, which make up their firing arc, and the three back faces make up their flank. This is a flank shot because it's firing at one of the three back faces. For a flank shot, you get plus one to your attack roll. Remember, to hit a heavy hitter, you usually need an attack roll of five, but this only needs a four. So blue rolls a seven, which is a hit, dealing six damage. Green rolls an armor save, saving three damage, but taking three damage. That means they have to damage three cards. For doing a flank shot, Blue also gets an achievement, so they'll move one space up the ratings board, unlocking their second upgrade. That was the last weapon, so now we move on to the tagging phase. The Glory Hound starts. At the moment, that's yellow. In turn order, each player can tag the face of each building that their robots are adjacent to. So yellow tags one here, and also one here. You get one sponsor card for each building tagged during each tagging phase, not per tag, but per building. Two buildings means yellow gets two sponsor cards. The hand limit on sponsor cards is five, so once you have more than five sponsor cards, you need to discard until you only have five. Blue now tags twice, here and here, but they only tagged one building, so they get one card. However, Blue's pilot is Jay, who has a special ability. When he tags one building twice, like he did here, he gets an extra sponsor card. That means he gets two sponsor cards. Blue now has four tags on this building. If you tag a building four times, you've demolished that building. So take the whole building and cap off, return those tags to the players, and place a tag in the rubble on the top of the building. Demolishing a building is another achievement, which moves Blue one space up the ratings track. Once a building is demolished, it no longer provides any kind of cover. Recon units can now move through that hex but none of the other pieces can move through that space, just like before. So the main change with the demolished building is that it no longer provides cover. Once a player has demolished four buildings, they win the game. The other way to win the game is to destroy all your opponent's heavy hitters. Green tags two times. Their heavy hitter could tag either of these two buildings, but because this building is being tagged by their support unit, they want to tag the other building so that they can get two sponsor cards. Orange now gets two tags, and they're going to over-tag. Whenever there's already a tag in a spot, a player can simply over-tag, so they tag Green's tag out and place their tag in, and the other tag goes back to that player. Orange is also going to tag with their heavy hitter here, so they've tagged two buildings and can now draw two cards. Everyone's had their turn, so that's the end of the tagging phase, and we can go on to the reset phase. All players reset their energy back to five, and draw cards to bring their hand back up to six cards. Then we decide who the Glory Hound is for the next round. The Glory Hound is the player who placed the most tags. If there's a tie, it moves to the next player clockwise from the current Glory Hound. In this round, everyone tagged twice, so Blue becomes the new Glory Hound because they're the next player clockwise from Yellow. That's the end of the entire round. Play will proceed to the next deploy phase, then movement, and so on, until one player either demolishes four buildings or destroys all the opposing heavy hitters. For a shorter game without player elimination, the game can optionally end when just one heavy hitter has been destroyed. At this stage, the remaining player with the highest score will be declared the winner. We hope you enjoyed this demonstration of GKR Heavy Hitters. Thanks for playing. And remember, drink Hapsi. It makes you happy. Thank you.